Let's look to the Lord in the Word of God uh, this evening. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Recording in progress. Gospel of Mark, and uh, I'll start reading from verse 12 onwards. Immediately, the Spirit drives him into wilderness. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. They went into Capernaum and straight away on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. Give me a second. Somebody needs something real quick. Maybe I'll have to read it again. Pat, I'll have to read it again. Sorry about that. Okay. And immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the bee wild beasts. The angels ministered unto him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, I will make you to become fishers of men. And straight away they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in ship mending their nets. And straight away he called them and, their, and left their father Zebedee and the ship with the hired servants and went after him. They went into Capernaum and straight away on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority not as the scribes. May the Lord add blessings to the reading and the hearing of this word. This week, uh, this, uh, this uh, evening, I would like to talk to you about the two aspects of the servant of Jehovah. The first one is the servant's authority, and the second one is servant's compassion. The first one, we begin to see there are three scenes in this whole act. First of all, the Gospel of Mark is what we, where we see Jesus on a mission. The servant of Jehovah, the servant of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, is on a mission, and he is on the move. You will read the word straight away, and he went, and thence, and you will see there is movement. You see actions in those words. Christianity is full of actions, not a bunch of words. What we are going to do this outreach next uh, Saturday <coughs> is indicative of that. We don't just preach a lot of sermons, but it is also important to live out our Christian life. Living out our Christian life with words, with actions that really show who we are. It says, immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. The first and foremost that you see about our Lord, he is led of the Spirit of God. That speaks about that our Lord operates within the will of God. Jesus said in the Gospel of John that I do what Father does and Father tells me. 
You know, you'll notice something over here is the authority of Jesus. In order to flow in authority, one should be under authority. Jesus was submitted to the Father. He surrendered his life willingly to come down on this earth to be a ransom for many. You notice that the Spirit led him. He was full of the Spirit. The, book, the Gospel of Luke says Jesus was uh, strong in spirit, being guided by the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of John, it talks about how the Spirit goes wherever the Spirit desires to go. To be guided of the Holy Spirit is so important in one's life. Paul says, walk in the Spirit. When you say walk in the Spirit, it means walking in step with Holy Spirit. What does it mean, walking in step with Holy Spirit? Walking in step with Holy Spirit means to hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking, number one, and acting upon what Holy Spirit has spoken. Which means one has to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, which means one has an ear to hear. One is not shut down to what Holy Spirit is speaking. Secondly, one is obedient and submissive to what the Spirit is speaking. The Spirit drives him into the wilderness. Here we see the temptations of our Lord. You will notice that the first Adam was tempted in the garden, but the last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, was tempted in a dangerous wilderness. Because of sin, there was thorns and thistles, so it was no more a garden. It was full of thorns and thistles, even in a figurative way, full of trouble and full of sin. The Bible says that Jesus took authority over that situation. In what the first Adam fell, the last Adam, Lord Jesus Christ, took authority over that. Through his, through his words of authority, he was able to drive away Satan. The, he spoke the word of God in each situation. He was 40 days in the wilderness with wild beasts. The Bible talks about he was with wild beasts. The first Adam had the dominion over the creation, but after the fall, he lost that dominion over the creation. But, but the wild beasts were subject to the last Adam, Lord Jesus Christ. It talks about that in Isaiah chapter 11, where a, a little child will put hand into the cockatrice den, the leopard, the calf, the lion, they are all going to lie, to, uh, lay down together, and they are going to eat grass. It is talking about a millennial kingdom. While Jesus was being tempted, Jesus gave a glimpse of his thousand years rule. This morning I was thinking some, something that the rulership of people in this world doesn't last. People think that they will rule forever, yet they do not know that they are at the mercy of God. Their life will snap like uh, at any moment. Even the strongest man is nothing but a breath. We all boast a lot of things, yet we do not know the next moment. But we know a king who is the king of kings. Your kingdom shall never end. That is the kingdoms of our Lord. And the Bible says we shall reign with him. While with the wild bees, they were subject to him. The Bible says that dominion was given to Adam. But that dominion was lost. The Bible says... God said to Adam, I've given you the dominion over the fish of the sea, fowls of the air, and all the beasts and the creeping things, and everything on this earth is subject to you. Yet because of sin, that was lost. But in last Adam, Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, we can see a picture of how those beasts were also in subjection. Now those beasts are also in subjection of those who walk with him. We have an amazing story of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 
when God shut the mouth of the lions. When you walk with God, when you are in the will of God, when you listen to God, and when you're obedient to when God says, you will see God's power and authority and dominion. One who lives in the rebellion will never see that. So Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. We see a parallel of that in this. You know, he had dominion over, over all this. The, 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 his dominion is a dominion of peace and righteousness. When our Lord shall return and establish his kingdom, indeed he is a servant with authority. Normally, servants are under authority, but we see a servant who is walking in authority and give orders. Jesus was victorious in, in the temptations, the three temptations Jesus had. Those are the three temptations every man has. Every man and woman that is born in this world goes through those three temptations, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Jesus overcame that in his first advent. And that is why the Bible says there is no temptation that has not been overtaken in all points. Our Lord was tempted. When you feel tempted and tried, know that Jesus went through everything that you and I would ever go through in life. And he was tried to the utmost. So we can have a great example in our Lord Jesus Christ. And every time he was tempted, this is what was his way to respond with the word of God. When Satan comes to you with things that will really wear you down, always look to what God's word says. God's word is alive, God's word is powerful, and God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word divides the, the flesh, the bones, and the marrows. You got to take the word very seriously. Many times, many people don't see the power of God in their life is because they have a tendency to see the word of God with a familiar attitude. You have to always see the word of God with a fresh perspective and with a fresh mind, with a new lens. You cannot look at the word of God from your old way of thinking. You have to realize that that word has the power. The Bible says... Jesus said to the Satan, when Satan command, told him, command to the stone to be made bread, because Jesus was hunger, hungered. Now I wanted to take a moment to say that Jesus had an actual physical body, and he experienced hunger like you and me. It talks about his humanity. While he hungered, he held on to the word of God. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, doth man live, for it is written. The word written in Greek means graphe, writings. Now when it's, it was spoken from the mouth of Jesus, it became rhema. The word rhema is like a dagger. So when you speak the word of God, that is written in the word of God, it is like a dagger that pierces into the chest of Satan. When Satan comes to you, you go and tell Satan, it is written. When something is written, it is legally binding, which means it has to be fulfilled. So you have to know something, the word of God is more legally binding than any laws of this world. Because the laws of this world can be tempered, the laws of this world can be changed, the laws of this world can be broken, and all kinds of things can happen. But the law of God shall remain, heaven and earth will pass away, not a single jot or a tittle from my word will ever pass away. The word of Lord is in heaven and, and settled in heaven and fulfilled down on this earth Jesus used the word of God and then Satan assured or Satan said you know look at the kingdoms of this world and I will give you and the glory of it which is given to me if you will come and worship before me and Jesus said to him oh it is written that that you shall not Worship anyone else other than you will not bow down before no one else other than Lord your God. 
You know, many times Satan will bring shortcuts in our lives and compromises and will show the things of this world. And it is easy to bow down, but that's where we take our stand. There is no room for compromise. Taking our stand. The Bible says, esteeming the reproaches of Christ, greater treasure, Moses, Moses forsook to be called the, the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses, Moses did not want to be identified and to live in a palatial home in Pharaoh's house because he was going to be the next to Pharaoh. He realized it is better to suffer with the people of God. The Bible says if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. Satan will show everything before us and say this looks beautiful, but uh, it will be at the cost of giving up uh, our greatest and the most prized, uh, our worship. The fight is always for worship. All the wars that have happened right from, right from the eternity has always been targeted on one thing, on worship. Satan will always fight through worship. Every war that is happening is boiled down to one thing, two, two, two worships. One is true worship, one is false worship. Sin happened in heaven when Lucifer who was the chief of the angels, who was the musician, had this thought in his heart when he thought as he was using his wings and music came out of him, he felt like he was, he could be equivalent with God. And the moment he had that thought, the Bible says, he thought in his heart he will be equivalent with the Most High. And there he fell in sin and one third of the angels were also thrown down onto this earth. And that very same Satan te tempted our Lord also because he was showing the temporal. He was showing the things that will burn into ashes. He was telling to Jesus, look at all this and all the glory and the splendor. But Jesus said, I came from the Father. You have not yet seen what that glory looks like. This is glory is incomparable nor your glory nor your wealth because it will all perish by fire then satan took him to the pinnacle of the temple the bible says pinnacle above the temple of jerusalem and told him that cast yourself thence for it is written he shall give his angels charge over thee satan also knows the bible he quoted psalm 91 the Bible says he shall give his angels charge over thee. Jesus said to Satan again, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. You shall not tempt your Lord, your God. Satan will come with those things. And don't be tempted because here, we are not here to test God for wrong reasons. The motive is always pure. So you see a servant with authority. And then in the second one, you see his preaching. It says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Here, Jesus is talking about a truth with authority. And... Here, this teaching is about his words that he spoke. The scribes spoke from authorities, but Jesus spoke with authority. Jesus spoke with authority because Jesus is the author of what he was going to say the time is fulfilled which means the time has come to its fullness god's kingdom is at hand what is the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is the spiritual influence of god's sphere of influence in every person's life and that sphere of influence comes through the gospel the evangelion or the good news the good news is the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
the power of the gospel. One should preach the gospel. Many times people think gospel has to be preached to sinners. No, gospel has to be first preached to the, those in the house of God. You might wonder and ask a question to me this evening. Why should you preach the gospel to yourself? Here's the answer. Because that gospel not only saves you and keeps sanctifying you. Not only that, that gospel is sacred. That gospel is sacred. That gospel is superior. And that gospel is the ultimate. The more you preach the gospel to yourself, the more you will know the power of the gospel. For a moment, I want to take you to the story of the gospel. What is that story of the gospel? The story of the gospel is you and I were condemned for sin. Now, this sin was nothing else but eternal separation from God. What is that eternal separation? You and I were destined to a lake of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Realize one thing, hell is real and heaven is real. And you and I were destined to be thrown into that place. We could not save ourselves. You could not bring anything to save yourself. You and I were standing in the courtroom of heaven. We were pronounced guilty. And the Bible says, the soul that sins shall be, shall be, shall die. So we were condemned to sin. And we could not save ourselves and we would have been eternally separated. In order to understand the gravity and the sacredness and how precious gospel is, you have to take a moment and understand what is happening in hell. For those who have rejected Jesus, those who have rejected accepting as the Lord and Savior, my beloved, they have slipped into a tragedy of eternity. Many times, many tragedies happen in this world. And we say, oh, that tragedy, that is not a tragedy. The real tragedy is to slip into eternity without knowing Jesus. Oh, there is a hell and a fire and those worms that are eating that flesh. And the men and those women who are there, they are more conscious. And it is a reality. We should weep and cry and pray every day for the souls because there is no way they are going to come back. God puts people in our lives with purpose. And there is a reason because they may come to you for different reasons, but ultimately it boils down to one reason, their eternity. Because all our labor one day will be over. All, all that we are doing will one day come to an end. And in the end, all it matters is do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, have you lived your life according to what His Word says? If one, if one has not received that grace of God that was given to them, there is no way to come back. I've heard from some people who have experienced hell and they have come back and shared their experience saying that, and they have wept and cried and said, not even your, oh, your enemy should go to hell. Whom you even think, they are not your even enemies, because there is no comeback. There are people crying out, oh, I wish I listened to that word when those people said. That is why don't take personal when people rebuke you or refuse you. Oh, I'm good. Don't worry because they, it is they are not hurt. They are not, your egos and my egos are not to be hurt because they are turning God, not you. You and I are just vessels that God sends. But we should be more motivated when we are rejected by people because this is not about us. You and I are called to be like firefighters. The Bible says in the book of Jude that he's snatching people, some who snatch people out of their fire, yet not getting their own garments burned. The gospel. You and I could not save ourselves. 
we were criminals. Father God looked at us. And the Bible says God could not look at us. And I want to bring you to that scene of heaven. And that's where Jesus said, I will give my life. That is why John 3.16, the greatest sermon for God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Oh, preach the gospel to yourself. Oh, you and I are. Oh, thank God for those who brought the gospel to us. Thank God for the Bible. Thank God for those who preach the gospel. Thank God for Jesus meeting you. Thank God for Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, we have to be so grateful every moment despite our trials, despite pain in the body, despite little noise, nausea, despite little problem in different life circumstances. Thank God for the salvation. Oh, what our life would be. Your life and my life is so secure in God because of Jesus Christ. We would have been in a place of tormenting. We would have been in a place of hell and fire and eternal judgment. Never able to make a comeback. Here, there is a chance. God who redeems. He is a God who redeems. Oh, he is going to redeem what you have lost in life. The greatest message is the message of the cross. Paul says, God forbid that I should always boast only save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because that message, the Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is foolishness unto those who are perishing, but through the full, uh, for the foolishness, the uh, foolish, the preaching of the gospel's foolishness. Uh, oh, many of us have been saved, many of who we were not born of the noble birth. Uh, oh, praise God, hallelujah! Oh, glory, 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 hallelujah! Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, that is why the Bible says, let not the wise boast in his wisdom, the strong in his strength, rich in his riches. Let him boast in the Lord. Praise God. He chose the foolish to confound the wise. Oh, glory to God. If you know Jesus, you are a wise person. Praise God. And the Bible says, He Christ is the wisdom of God. If you lack wisdom, ask God. And that cross is a great cross. Why I boast in the cross, Paul says, because it is a great cross. It makes foolish ones wise. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, those who were not born of noble birth are now in the family of God. We are the royal priesthood. Oh, the holy generation. We who were once outcast and out of the commonwealth of Israel have now become the family of God. Now we are partakers and joint heirs with Christ. That's what cross has done for you and me. You and I have become great. Oh, this cross is a great cross. Not only this cross is a great cross, though this cross also has done something special. The Bible says when he died on the cross and when he went into the depths of the earth, he made a public shame of the devil. He stripped Satan of his power on the cross. Oh, the Bible says sin, hell and death were destroyed by his power. He, did, he took authority back. Glory to God. That's why it says, the Bible says, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus destroyed the power of sin. Jesus destroyed the power of hell. Jesus destroyed the power of death. That was the enemy of man. Therefore, this cross destroyed that giant that was standing against you and me. Oh, that Goliath, that like that Goliath that was standing against David. This cross, oh, this Jesus, oh, at the cross destroyed that giant. And therefore, it is a great cross. It is the giant cross. Oh, it is not just a giant cross. 
Oh, there is something more. You and I were in darkness. The Bible says we were dead in trespasses. We were alienated from God. Oh, our hearts and minds were darkened with sin. And Jesus appeared in our lives. And the glory shone on us. And the glory shined like the shine. Oh, that changed my darkness. Oh, what a change in my soul since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, he changed me inside out. And he said, I give the glory that the Father has given. Oh, this cross is a great cross. This cross is a giant cross. This cross is a glorious cross. Oh, glory to God. And then what he did was, Oh, in the courtroom of heaven, this is what happened. Oh, Jesus stepped in and said, I gave my life. Oh, he became the substitutionary payment. You owe a large sum, an infinite amount. You could never pay it. You could, you could work for all your life, yet you and I will never be able to pay this debt of sin. Oh, I feel to preach the gospel this after this evening because we need to hear it. Church needs to hear it. Oh, you and I could not pay the debt. The hymn writer sings, says like the single sing of him who died for me, paid the debt and made me free. He paid the debt and made me free. You and I were tied and bound like slaves, slaves to sin. We do not know what to do. And Jesus stepped in and paid the price and set you and me free. He substituted, he paid the price, he redeemed you, he bought you back. Not only he bought you back. Then what he did, what happened in that courtroom was he took a garment. Oh, and he put out that garment over you and me. Oh, till this moment, oh, Father God could see a sinner. But at this moment, when Jesus put a garment, oh, the Bible says he put a robe of righteousness over me. Oh, when the prodigal came back, oh, the Father put a robe over him, a robe to cover his sin. Oh, now, oh, I don't see your sin anymore. More. I see you, oh righteous. That is why Paul, oh in an ecstatic way says, there is therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. You are not condemned. Don't condemn yourself. You are not supposed, supposed to condemn yourself because you did not give life for yourself. Jesus gave. If anyone could condemn, that's Jesus. Neither you condemn nor others condemn. And Jesus says, I also don't condemn. That's what happened when they brought the woman caught with adultery christians have a problem we try to condemn ourselves we don't we don't want to tap into the grace of jesus christ oh i'm not good enough just shut that speaking you are good enough because of jesus when you constantly say that you are saying cross is not enough for you when you say those words, you are, rely, you are relying on your humanity and your human understanding and wisdom. Now we have to step out of that because the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, one is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. Glory to God. He has redeemed, he has justified me. The Bible, John, Apostle John says, Oh, beloved, if our hearts condemn us, oh, God is greater than our hearts. Oh, God is greater than, don't condemn yourself for your past sins and mistakes. We all have sinned. Everybody on this earth has sinned except for Jesus. He was the sinless, sa sinless savior, perfect. Paul was a murderer. Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Oh, Peter betrayed Jesus. Jonah was a cop out. He walked away. Adam sinned. 
Noah drank the wine. I mean, you can go on. Jacob was a supplanter. Judah Gomel committed incestuous relationship. Samson fell in the arms of Delilah. But still you notice when in the book of Hebrews it talks about Samson. Yipta gave his daughter as a wow when he should not have done that. Every great Bible character were failures. Rahab was a harlot. You know that failure also shows the grace on the other side. Praise God for all my failures because he turns my, my defeats into success. He takes my mess and makes a message. He takes my test and makes a testimony. My setbacks are becoming the setups. My stumbling blocks have become my stepping stones. Praise God. Hallelujah. We are in good company. Oh, I am in good company with you. I am not better than you. You are not better than me. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. It is the mercies of God. Hallelujah. Preach the gospel. Oh, you. He, he, he atoned your sin. He substituted it. He redeemed you. He brought you back. He justified you. Not only he justified. This is what he did. Then the Bible says, just as if you have never sinned. Then the Bible says, he also predestinated you. You are a a man and a woman with a destiny. Oh, when you were oh, nothing, when you were not even born into this world, while you were still a thought in God's heart, oh, he pre-designed a plan for you, desire to live that destiny, desire to live that full life, Oh, until our Lord returns, I pray that prayer every day. God, help me learn that destiny. Oh, you wrote for me before even I was conceived in my mother's womb. Pray that prayer every day, my friend, my sister, my brother, because God wants you to live that full life. Because on that day, books will be open. Jesus will say, oh, you had great potential. Why didn't you live that full life? You are supposed to live that full life for Jesus. He predesigned you. He justified you. He redeemed you. He glorified you. Hallelujah. He gave you glory. And not only he gave you glory, he made you to sit next to Jesus. You are sitting with Jesus in heavenly places. You are, the, your spirit is seated with Jesus even now. I don't feel it. Your feelings are not what word is. Feelings don't determine. Feelings come like wind and waves and they go away. But God's word stays forever. We are not. So when you are a sinner, you are a slave. From slave, he made us his own children. From murderers, sinners, from a sinner who committed crime, you became saved a saint. And from saint, you are each day being sanctified and becoming a son. That is a special title, a special inheritance you and I have. That is the gospel of grace. And that grace is it is not based on what you deserve. We don't deserve anything other than the judgment of God. Every time I walk into this building, I say, Lord, we don't deserve anything, Lord. This is your mercy. Every time I walk around this campus, I say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, who are we, Lord? You would be merciful to us to even have us to be in this place. We don't deserve anything. That is what grace is. The grace of God. Hallelujah. Oh, he gives you oh, his unmerited favor. That is the grace of God. What you have never <clears throat> deserved. You get it. And mercy is, you don't get what you are supposed to get. You see, mercy and grace come together. 
here the grace of God. And as Jesus preaches his message, he finds his disciples. The Bible says, as he begins to minister, these he finds these people. Now as he walked out by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew brothers casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. You notice something over here is Jesus on the lookout for people. It was not Simon and Andrew who saw Jesus. It was Jesus who saw them. Jesus is looking at you. Not you are looking, which means he first saw you. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Oh, hallelujah. The Bible says in the book of Romans, the one who loved us. The Greek understanding is the one who kept on loving us from eternity. It is in the present continuous tense, which means he continues to love you and me even when we sin, even when we do things wrong. He says, I still love you. I love you with an everlasting love. Oh, I hate the sin you do, yet I love. Son, daughter, come back home. I will heal your backsliding. Jesus saw and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me. The word come is a very special word. Every time Jesus said the word come, it means that when you follow Jesus, when you come after Jesus, oh, you are in safe hands. That is the call of God upon our lives. It is a holy calling. Oh, it is a heavenly calling. It is a high calling. He is calling people oh, to himself. And in that call, he will take care of everything that you need for life and godliness he will give you everything the bible says they forsook their net somebody is doing fishing business and to step out of that requires faith they stepped out in faith and straight away they forsook their nets and followed him because he was the servant of Jehovah with authority. When he spoke, they heard and they listened. And when he had gone a little further, Jesus is not yet done with his mission. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, also were in the ship mending the nets. And straight away he called them and they left their father. The Bible says, one who wants to follow after me will not forsake father or mother is not good to inherit the kingdom. Now it here does not mean abandonment. See, forsaking and abandonment are different because now the English, there's a play of words over here. You have to understand here is that not being attached in a worldly sense here it means you can still be responsible, yet in your heart now Jesus is the Lord. Here forsaking means the lordship of your life now belongs to God. He decides the way you live your life. That is what that forsaking means. And they went into Capernaum. The third scene that we see over here is that Jesus taught the word of God. Synagogues were those fellowship places. There were no sacrifices done, but it was the place where prayer, word, and fellowship happened. And every visiting rabbi was given the opportunity to read the word, and that rabbi taught Jesus was a Jew, and Jesus followed the customs of the Jew. On a Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue. 
In order to reach the Jewish people, Jesus identified with them and Jesus was in their midst. Jesus first went to his own. We minister first to our own people, our own family, and then we go into the world. And there we see as Jesus was teaching, he was teaching with authority. They were astonished at his doctrine. They were amazed by his teaching because he was not teaching as the scribe. He was teaching with authority. And when it said teaching with authority, the Bible says there was in the synagogue a man with unclean spirit. I'm sure the unclean spirit was there before also, but that never manifested because the, the scribes in that place taught the word without power. They taught with the word. The Bible says the letter kills, the spirit gives life. There was no life, that is why no manifestation. But it was when, when the demons saw Jesus, they identified. And it says that, oh, they began to shout and sing, let us alone. Oh, the demons began to be tormented, the presence of Jesus. The Bible says, in the presence of Jesus, these demons tremble at the presence of Jesus. When you are walking with Jesus, no demon, no witchcraft, no power of the devil can come against you. Because, oh, they tremble at the voice of Jesus, at the words of Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. The Bible says, these demons cried out and said, let us alone, what have we to do with Jesus of Nazareth? They knew the address of Jesus from where he come, art thou come to destroy? They were so fearful when they saw him because they were scared. Those demonic spirits began to manifest. And Jesus rebuked them. The Bible says in verse 25, hold thy peace and come out of him. What it means is he muzzled that spirit, basically stilled it. And the Bible says in verse 26, the unclean spirit came out, had torn him and cried with a loud voice and came out of him. That unclean spirit left him and they were all amazed and that they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he, even the unclean spirits, they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. For with, forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon. Now you will notice something over here is the second aspect. Very quickly I will cover, finish it. The second aspect is the sympathy or the compassion of the servant. The first one was the authority of the servant. The second one is the compassion. We see two miracles over here. The Bible says, forthwith when they came out of synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon. Simon, I not only want you, not only do I want Andrew, but I also want your whole family. When Simon comes, Along with Simon comes the complete package. The whole family will be saved. The Bible says when Rahab believed God, her whole household was saved. Oh, when the New Testament, when the jailer believed and gave his life, the Lord also saved his whole family. The Lord will save your family. Are you going to believe that this evening? Jesus is able to do. He does not just save you and keep you happy and you are in this bus going, oh, get ready, Jesus. I am coming. No, Jesus says, oh, that one also has to come. Tommy has to come. James has to come. Patrick has to come. Oh, the Rene has to come. Kiera has to come. They all have to get into the bus. We cannot let them alone or they will go into hell. I have to get them all. The whole family is coming to Jesus. You are the first one. But through you, we are going to get everybody. We are going to plunder hell and populate heaven. Souls are coming in this place in Jesus' name. Thousands and thousands of souls are coming. Are you going to believe that? 
Oh, pastor, even few people don't show up. Oh, that's okay. God works when there is nothing. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created all and it was void and form. I will leave it. We will see the great first revival in this land. I prayed a prayer, Lord. Oh, help me see that revival. Oh, Lord, give me long life to see that. Oh, give me life to see. Oh, soul saved. Somebody told me the other day, Oh, Pastor Abraham, many sons. I said, yes. Oh, I, oh, sitting under my breath, I said, My one son is in heaven. Give me millions, Lord. I'm crying out. Sons and daughters. Hallelujah. Oh, Oh, his, our life, our assignment is not done. That's why we are praying every day. Oh, Pastor, why are we praying every day? Oh, there's more people in the town. Oh, two million people in two counties, Westmoreland and Allegheny County. We got to at least get one percent of that in our church. If we can, we will. Let all the church also, also desire the same way. Hallelujah. There's all oh, for everyone to work. There's so much of people in this, in this, uh, in this region. Oh, we need, to, we need to win souls for Jesus. Oh, your family is coming to Jesus. Are you going to believe that you're going to bring them to the church this Sunday? Oh, believe it. Hallelujah. God is able to do it. Oh, not just Simon and Andrew. We are getting into your house. Jesus is getting into the house. Jesus went into the house. Look at the influence of Jesus. Simon, Andrew, and James, and John. Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever. So when you go into the house, there's problem. And Anon, they tell him of her. And they immediately tell her. And he came and took her by the hand. The Bible says in the book of Sam, he shall take me by his right hand and lead me to glory. The glorious Savior was standing before the mother-in-law of Peter. And she was completely healed. When you have had a bad fever, let's say 105, 106, it takes a while to recover. The Bible says in the next verse, and at the event, oh, the Bible says she immediately, the fever left, and she ministered. She cooked the food for him. Hallelujah. What a miracle. The one moment you are sick, the next moment you are so healed as if you never had fever. Now you are cooking for the Savior. Praise God when we serve Jesus. The Bible says all the city was gathered together. Oh yes, when miracles happen, I am believing there will... Oh, last week I was in Coriopolis. And church, I am challenging you. We will have a Friday night miracle healing service in this building. We are going to put signboards, healing service. Jesus is going to show up. Lame and the maim and the blind and the demon possessed are going to be healed by the mighty power of God. We are going to take some challenges. Oh, Christianity involves taking some risks. It is not for the weak and the frail. It is for the ones who are courageous and bold to take the steps of faith. Oh, this April 20th, we are going to step out in faith and believing this is a holy ground. God has blessed this ground. These people who come in this place are going to be blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. This is the last days. Everything that we dare do and say is going to glorify Jesus. Lives are going to be transformed. Hallelujah. Be stubborn for Jesus. Oh, be, oh, don't be a quitter. When the going gets tough, the tough gets the going. You got to have a thick skin. Don't get hurt when oh people get personal. Oh, they did not hurt you. They said about Jesus. Chloe. Hallelujah. The Bible says they, everyone gathered together and he healed many that were sick. I am receiving this word for Rehoboth. There will be healing services in this place. And we declare it, Lord, on this holy ground, these carpets. Oh, Lord, you will heal the sick in Jesus' name. And in the morning, rising up a great while, he went out and departed in the solitary place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm going to conclude with this. Jesus, our Savior, a servant with authority and a servant who is compassionate. 
is loving and compassionate. Oh, come to him. Lord Jesus, your word was ministered this evening. And your presence was manifest. Lord, we believe what happened in the gospel of Mark will manifest in our services, Lord. There will be a powerful Thursday service, a miracle Friday services. We are believing for God to touch the lost. Miraculous things are coming. Oh, Lord, touch their families, Lord. Oh, they represent families. Jesus not only touches individuals, he touches the whole household. Oh, touch the household. There are still in those houses, they have not known Jesus. Lord, let this be the time Jesus visits those whole houses. Praise God for what you are going to do. To God be the glory, to God be the honor. Praise God. It has fallen on a good ground. Manifest the word in your mighty way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.